right, well, I come to these talks mostly for the flattering introductory remarks <laughs> <laughs> at the start. I'm going to speak probably for about 35, 40 minutes today, uh, which usually when I lecture to my students is a total lie and I go on and on, so someone will give me the hook at some point here. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, how the internet changed history and historians. And uh, I want to start by playing a couple of things for you that I think are kind of amazing. Here we are. Okay. So that beautiful clip <laughs> is the oldest known audio recording of a human voice. It's the oldest known audio recording of a human voice. It's 1860. The song you heard is Eau Claire de la Lune, recorded by Edward Leon Scott de Martinville. And it was originally captured using a phonogram, which was a device that uh, he had invented that captures sound out of the air and visualizes the waveforms. But it was never intended to play back the sound. It was intended to capture the sound and then show it to you. In 2008, a team of audio historians, sound engineers, and technicians and other ex experts at uh, University of California took that waveform and reproduced it as audio, bringing back to life the voice from 1860 and in human history, it's the oldest piece of evidence we have of a human voice that we can capture from the past. And now some video. There's a lot more there. I'll share the link with you later if you'd like. In 2012, the past president of the American Historical Association, William Cronin, wrote the following in a series of short articles about the influence of the internet on historical scholarship. Truism or not, I want to assert that the times in which we, are, uh, in which we live are different enough that both the practice and the profession of history are undergoing changes quite unlike any we've experienced before. I increasingly believe that the digital revolution is yielding transformations so profound that their nearest parallel is to Gutenberg's invention of movable type more than half a millennia ago. Today I want to talk to you about the internet, historians, and the practice of history. And in particular, I'd like to highlight some of the ways in which online digital technologies have changed and will continue to change historical scholarship 
the historical profession, both within the academy and beyond. And I'll draw from my own experience as a relatively new historian to speak about the ways in which my own career as a historian changed in a short period of time as a result of online digital technologies. My experience is that of a generation of historians who straddle the boundary between analog and a digital age. When I began my graduate studies here at York in 2002 as a master's student, this is what the website for York University looked like in 2002. Google was only five years old. Digital photography was emerging but not yet popularized. Online digital video was not yet ubiquitous. YouTube was still three years away. The smartphone revolution had yet to take off. Laptop computers were uncommon sites in graduate programs. Blogging was still relatively unknown in the academy. And very few scholarly journals were fully digitized, and still fewer archives had digitized records. And within a short period of time, as I began my doctoral studies, the internet changed. New online digital technologies emerged and became not just accessible, but ubiquitous. And my work as a historian changed along the way as a result. Now the audio and the video that I played for you at the beginning, I think, are incredible examples of the ways in which technology can reshape our ability to understand the past. Photography, recorded sound, moving images, as much as movable type, were revolutionary technologies that gave us the ability to inscribe and record events, creating fragments of the past for future generations to read, to hear, and to see. The discipline of history as a scholarly profession emerged at the same time in the 19th century that inventors like Thomas Edison were working to popularize technologies that could seemingly hold on to pieces of the past and transmit them into the future. The phonograph, the kinetoscope, the camera, even Gutenberg's movable type, these were time machines preserving artifacts of the past to be transmitted to historians in the present. Today I can watch a scene of the streets of London from 1890, but I can also compare it side by side to the same scenes in the 21st century. And I can transmit those images to an audience of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, nearly instantaneously. And I can link then to digitized records about the history of those images like the patents for Edison's kinetoscope filed over a century ago. I can search thousands of books of information about the history of film technology in a matter of seconds. Nearly all facets of the practice of history have been influenced by the internet. And they'll continue to be influenced by the internet. And I'll talk a bit about my experience as a historian and the practices of history and where I've seen those changes. Now, now, I'm assuming not everyone here is a historian and may not be familiar with the three core practices of history, at least that which I was trained in here at York. The first is research, the second is analysis, and the third is communication. All three areas have been substantially changed as a consequence of online digital technologies. As a doctoral candidate, when I began my research after completing coursework and exams in 2004, I embarked on my dissertation research that summer investigating the environmental history of Vancouver Stanley Park. I traveled to British Columbia where I worked in several archives, the repositories of the fragments of the past that were left behind as a consequence of technologies like movable type, recorded audio, and recorded video. My research took me into archives in Vancouver, Victoria, Ottawa, where I pulled out box upon box upon box of letters, reports, and other files relating to the history of Stanley Park. And as I searched databases, some of which were digital and some of which were in uh, binders, printed out finding aids, that's the method by which I found these records. I consulted with archivists and librarians. And when I went into the newspaper record, to try and understand the history of this park. I read newspapers on microfilm, searching hand-typed indexes 
and manually scanning issues of newspapers day after day after day for a period of Stanley Park's history from 1887 to the present. Or what was the present back then? <laughs> if I wanted to make copies of any of these records, I had to photocopy them or I had to print them out using a microfilm printer. Once I had gathered those materials, I entered into the more complicated proposition of analyzing them. I had to sit down and read through these documents, deep reading, interpretation, integration of insights from the historiography or the work of other scholars, application of theory, piecing together numerous fragments of historical data into a narrative of change over time. These are the traditional practices of historical analysis. And once I had got something that looked like a story, I had to put it together in a way that I could communicate it to other scholars and, and broader audiences, weaving threads into a tapestry. Historians are storytellers. The discipline is narrative. I had to find the story in the archive and bring it to life in text. The format of that text was my dissertation, and it later became this book on the environmental history of Stanley Park. And that took no time, right? <laughs> <laughs> that took no time. Anybody who's doing fast math here, this book was published in 2013. Didn't he say he started in 2004? Holy smokes. <laughs> it took nearly a decade. All three of these practices of historical scholarship, research, analysis, and communication, have been changed as a result of online digital technologies. And those changes started during the course of my doctoral studies. The microfilm printer that I was using halfway through my research period changed into a microfilm scanner. And then those newspapers changed from microfilm into online newspaper archives. And those records that I was pulling out of the archives no longer existed only in boxes, but they existed on screens and eventually on phones and eventually on tablets and probably now on watches. <laughs> now the primary way I think that the internet has changed historical research can be summed up in a word. Abundance. Abundance. With the digitization and online dissemination of historical records, historians now face an abundance challenge or an abundance problem. Take, for example, this. This is Early English Books Online, a mass digitization project of early modern English books spanning nearly every printed book from 1475 to 1700. It is an incredible archive. It's appropriate for this talk, right? <laughs> it's an incredible archive. The collection includes more than 125,000 titles. It's searchable by keyword, dates, author name, subject. With one search using the word Canada, I found 1,477 instances of the use of that word in books published in English between 1475 and 1700 in over 245 titles, including the earliest English translation of Jacques Cartier's narrative of his voyages to New France, first published in 1580. And I was still wearing my pajamas at this point. <laughs> Here's another example, more Canadian history appropriate. Early Canadiana Online, another mass digitization project, a virtual archive and library of books, periodicals, and other documents relating to Canadian history. It includes hundreds of thousands of titles spanning a period from the early 16th century to the mid 20th century. <clears throat> Again, it's searchable by keyword, title, author, subject. My favorite feature that I show students when they're doing historical research projects, if you can't think of what you want to do your project on, just go to Early Canadiana Online and click this button here. It says random document. <laughs> and it'll randomly pull something out of that archive. And when I did this yesterday, it pulled up this. This is the, an 1896 issue of the Northwest Review, which you're probably all familiar with, the only English language Catholic newspaper published in Winnipeg in the late 19th century. 
Historical documents have been scanned and disseminated online, making the primary source materials of historical scholarship accessible in an astonishing, astonishing fashion. But perhaps more importantly, it vastly expands the volume and the range of accessible historical records, making them more discoverable through search technologies that crawl the text of these documents, allowing me to type in the word Canada and to find over a thousand instances. If we consider just the newspaper research that I conducted for my dissertation, as I was using microfilm copies of newspapers, running them through decades old machines and panning and scanning to look for instances of the term Stanley Park. I was aided only in that process by a handmade index that was produced by the Legislative Library of British Columbia in the 1970s. No keyword searching. No digital archive. Today I can access many of those newspapers and many more from across Canada and the United States digitally using much more powerful search tools. And my new research has greatly benefited from these tools and expanding my access to what I can look at, what I can analyze in the past. And I can now ask questions that I couldn't ask before. This is a project that I'm working on now. It's a history of the great epizootic. Hands up if you've never heard of this. <laughs> Oh, but you will. <laughs> the Great Epizootic <clears throat> was a continent-wide pandemic of equine influenza, horse flu. It infected nearly every horse in urban North America over the course of 50 weeks in 1872 and 1873. And it originated here in Toronto. And it spread through every major city of the United States, from the Atlantic to the Pacific coasts. It went into Mexico, it went as far south as Nicaragua. I wanted to trace this disease, to follow its path, to try and understand how it spread, what effects it had on Canadian and US cities, at a time when horses provided the primary mode of intra-urban transportation. The disease wasn't fatal, it incapacitated horses for up to three to four weeks at a time. But imagine if the entire transit system of Toronto suddenly stopped for three to four weeks at a time. Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> but also imagine if the entire intra-city trucking system stopped and groceries couldn't be delivered to grocery stores. Right? This is the impact that this disease had on cities across the continental United States and Canada. For the most part, newspapers provided the only record of the spread of a disease that was short-lived and rarely fatal. And the digitization of the Canadian and US newspaper archives has allowed me to access records from nearly every city that was affected by the great epizootic. And because these databases are keyword searchable, the work of tracing the disease was much quicker. I was able to find references that may not have been possible with analog newspaper search methods that I had used as a graduate student. Were I to pan and scan microfilm from 164 cities across Canada and the United States, I wouldn't be standing here before you today. I would still be on city 10 or 11. <laughs> but I was able to do this last summer finding the presence of the disease in 164 cities across Canada and the United States. The search for records has been expanded. But with the abundance of digitized historical records and the opportunity to do this kind of research, it creates an analysis problem. It creates an analysis problem. The scale of the available records that historians have now at their fingertips exceeds the capacity of a single human to read within a human lifetime. The archive of early Canadiana online, were it to be printed, wouldn't fit in an airplane hangar. It wouldn't fit in two airplane hangars. It wouldn't fit in a hundred airplane hangars. We're talking about acres and acres and acres of records. 
if we now have access to mass amounts of historical data, the traditional methods of deep reading, interpretation, integration of ideas from other scholars, and the application of theory must change. Each of these methods is still relevant, but the scale of accessible sources means that historians now require machine assistance in the analysis of these materials. The search engine is the most commonly used machine assistance tool for the analysis of digitized records. We use it every day. We use it every day. If anybody remembers the dark, cold days of the Yahoo Index in the 1990s, you'll know how crude searching digitized records used to be. Oh, I want to find a recipe, I'll go to the Yahoo Recipes page and hope to God something relevant shows up. <laughs> the internet before Google. Search engines help us sort through the material to find what might be relevant. But as Professor Ian Milligan from University of Waterloo has reminded us, the quality of the search tools that we use to search for digitized records should be the subject of critical analysis itself. How was the search engine programmed? What does it search? The critical element for much historical research is a technology called optical character recognition. It's software that can read the image of a document and interpret it as text, allowing you to type in keyword searches to see what's in that Northwest Review or to see what's in that English language edition from 1580 of Cartier's Voyages. But how good is that optical character recognition software when it comes to interpreting the complexities of even just the English language in the past? How does optical character recognition software interpret the long S? The long S. Paradise Loft, <laughs> right? This is an artifact of Roman cursive writing that was awkwardly integrated into movable type in the early modern period. The long S was eventually eliminated by the early 19th century, but to optical character, rec character recognition technology, it reads as an F rather than an S. So when you search for paradise lost, paradise might not show up, but paradise might. <laughs> this is just one challenge of machine assisted analysis of historical materials. These are limits that could potentially be overcome, and in many cases they are. In spite of these limits, machine assisted analysis can yield fascinating insights into the past that historians could not have done previously on their own. Even with a team of all the historians from the history department here at York, we could not achieve the kind of analysis that the Google Ngram viewer can achieve. The Ngram viewer is one of the most popular examples of text mining and analysis of historical records. It uses a database of scanned books that Google collected over several years scans of a nearly comprehensive archive of English publications from 1800 to 2012. And it's a tool that can allow us to see word frequency over time in the collection of English writing over a couple centuries. And this is one I like to show as an example. This chart here compares frequency of usage of the term environmental crisis and oil crisis. And I've limited it here to the period after 1950, up to 2000. Now, does anybody see anything interesting here on this, uh, on this chart? We see at the end of the 1960s into the beginning of the 1970s, an increase in the frequency of the usage of the term environmental crisis in blue, and suddenly a dip. And then it re-emerges again at the beginning of the 1990s into the mid-1990s and it onward to the 21st century. On the opposite end of things, the term oil crisis starts to see peak usage at the same time that environmental crisis starts to decline. And the beginning of the decline of the use of the term environmental crisis is 1973. Does anybody know what happened in 1973? <laughs> OPEC oil embargo on North America, right? O OPEC oil embargo. And we know from historians of the environmental movement 
that the movement itself changed in 1973 as a result of the oil crisis. This tool allows us to confirm, at least in popular consciousness and in English writing, that phenomenon in a way that would have been impossible by hand. A similar tool from the New York Times Digital Labs called Chronicle has helped me see something about my own work on the great epizootic that I hadn't considered before. The term epizootic. It's a weird word. It's a term used to describe an epidemic disease among animals. Right? It's the equivalent of the word epidemic, but for animals instead of humans. Right? It can refer to anything. It could be an epizootic of hog cholera, an epizootic of rinderpest, an epizootic of, I don't know, something else that animals get afflicted with. But I argue that the term epizootic actually only refers to this instance of equine influenza in the 19th century in terms of popular writing. This is frequency of usage of the term epizootic in the New York Times from 1860 to 2010. It's almost only ever used to describe this one disease. And in fact, when we go into the newspaper record and see how humans talked about the equine influenza epidemic of 1872-73, they often just called it the epizootic, as though the name of the disease was epizootic. And historically since, we've never seen that term used so closely with one specific disease. Again, it's a tool, a machine-assisted text analysis tool that allowed me to see something about English language discourse in North America that I couldn't see otherwise. The same is true when you do this with the Globe and Mail, or the Globe for the period. Why was there a spike in 1980? So uh, right here, oh, 1980? No, Sorry. Right here. So right here, most of these articles are references to the earlier epizootic. Right. Ref retrospectives, reflections, talking about it in 1874, 1875. Machine-assisted analysis of large data sets of historical records is also allowing historians to see new things about historical spatial relationships that we couldn't see before using Historical Geographic Information Systems, or HGIS. We can now visualize historical records spatially and understand those records uh, geographically. Uh, she was talking about the blip between 1960 and 1970. Ah, right here. I haven't a clue what that is. <laughs> it might be a Rinderpest outbreak in Europe. HGIS allows us to take historical data and map it. This is a really simple tool all of you can use called Google Maps Engine. You probably use a version of it on your phone all the time when you navigate to get from your house to a restaurant that you've never been to before. Using this simple HGIS tool to visualize the spatial history of the Great Epizootic, I was able to plot all the cities that were affected. But the more significant thing is the H in HGIS, history, change over time. I wanted to see how the disease moved. These plots represent data on a map uh, that I can share with someone. And when you click on each of them, it shows you all of the newspaper records that confirm the first appearance of the disease in the cities shown on the map. And then I can take that and animate the map to show where the disease first appeared across North America. And when you do that, it looks like this. And a number of things become evident when you watch the animation. The disease explodes in the eastern seaboard, but as it moves westward, it slows down to a trickle as it passes through the Sierra Nevada and it vanishes, only to reemerge a couple of weeks later in the mining towns in Nevada and into California. And it picks up its speed again, sweeps northward up the Pacific Northwest coast, and trundles its way through Oregon, Washington. And finally, 
We won't sit and wait to the very end. When you get to the end of the timeline here, the last instance in the caribou region of British Columbia of the arrival of the disease. This confirmed to me the disease itself was following the flows of horse bodies in urban North America. The northwest, or sorry, the eastern seaboard of the United States was the densest environment of horses in North America in 1872. The disease was like a fire burning through fuel. As it expended itself through the bodies of horses in the northeast, it moved into the less populous regions of the mid-continent. Slowly until it get, got to California, the densest urban environment on the Pacific coast. And it picked up its speed there. These technologies give us the ability to see this, give us the ability for one historian to do this over the course of a lonely summer. <laughs> and I hope reveal new insights. In a more detailed version of this map, I overlay the railway network. And you can see the degree to which the disease was following the railway, the degree to which it was following stagecoach routes, and the, de the degree to which it didn't move in a single wave, but if you go down in a closer view of the eastern seaboard, it actually hits large urban centers and then bounces backward into their hinterlands. Right? Because New York and Boston were more directly connected than the smaller towns and villages surrounding them. When I looked at this, it was like looking at a fluorescent dye or a radioactive dye being injected into somebody's veins. And you can see it flow through. So the last thing I want to talk about then is the communication of history in the digital age. And the ways in which the internet has changed how we disseminate research findings, how we tell stories about the past and share those stories with one another. Historians in the academy have traditionally relied on two primary modes of disseminating their research. Journal articles and books but mainly books. Both of these forms of publication have rapidly changed, and new forms of publication are becoming more readily available. Online digital communication of history holds both the potential to disrupt traditional forms of scholarly publishing and make historical scholarship accessible to audiences beyond the academy in ways that previously were not unknown. In particular, I'll talk about a couple. The first is blogging. <laughs> blogging. What began as the art of writing about what you ate for breakfast has rapidly transformed into writing about what you ate for breakfast and what you do for a living. In 2009, I started a research blog. And this was only just beginning where uh, historians and other scholars would keep <coughs> a regular tally of their research as they went along, writing short articles rather than waiting 10 years until their book came out. I published my first post on this blog in May 2009, and I've since kept it going in various more modern and spiffy looking forms. It has a, had a viewership of 65,000, uh, more than 65,000 views since 2010 with my hot June 2012 month, where there were 3,803 <laughs> views. I show the numbers, not just to show how cool my website is, but the scale of the audience, the scale of the audience is vastly exceeds the audiences that historians have had in the past. A best-selling book in Canada is only about 1,000 books sold. About 1,000 books sold. So there's small uh, readers, readership market here. Blogging and history go really well together. History is a narrative discipline. We like to do writing. This gives us an opportunity to do a different kind of writing, short form writing. It gives us an opportunity to write about our work to an audience that goes beyond our peers and in a way that can enrich our work. Because of course, there are communities of historians outside of universities who do ample uh, an admirable research using records that we often can't find because we're not as familiar with the local contexts that we're studying. It also gives academic historians a, uh, an outlet for time sensitive matters. We constantly rail in the history department that nobody listens to the historians. We've seen this all before. We could really help, right? If only they'll read our books, it'll come out. 
seven years from now, and then the whole thing will change. <laughs> this form of scholarly communication proved particularly useful for my latest research project, not the epizootic, but something that I'm doing that's much newer now, which is an investigation of the historical safety record of oil pipelines in Canada. This is a project that is quantifying the history of onshore oil spills along Canada's system of long distance oil pipelines under the regulatory authority of the National Energy Board. And I first started publishing the initial research findings on my own website and on another uh, group blog uh, that was created by a team of graduate students from the history department at York University called Active History. Active History. The purpose of the blog was to take research findings from universities, historical research findings from universities, and present it in a way that is accessible to communities outside of universities, particularly research findings that were timely and could provide insight into contemporary issues. In 2011, there was a massive 28,000 barrel onshore oil spill in northern Alberta the day before the federal election. News of the spill came out two days after. I was living in Calgary at the time, and when the environment minister uh, first spoke about the spill, he claimed that, let's see, we got it right here. Sure, there are incidents from time to time, but I would put our record up against any other. And I thought, your record? Okay, well, let's go see what the record is. And it turns out the record was not there. So I thought, well, I'm sure some obnoxious historian will just start counting how many oil spills there were, and we'll find out whether or not these were exceptional instances. And I was that obnoxious historian, and I started counting them, and I published this first article on Alberta's oil spill history, which revealed that in just the last five years, there had actually been tens of millions of liters of oil spilled in that province alone, totaling thousands of onshore oil spills. I since, I've since published several more articles with Active History on this project. Most of the research for this project has come out on the Active History blog. And it's had a tremendous advantage to reaching um, communities and mobilizing our research in a way that has an impact on the public and on policy. I was surprised to find that these articles were suddenly being cited in places I had never expected. I started to get phone calls from curious journalists from newspapers and uh, radio media. I did about 47 interviews over one summer about this work. And the most interesting citations that I found were in letters written to the National Energy Board for the hearings on the construction of the Northern Gateway Pipeline through British Columbia that started citing my blog. And then in 2012, a parliamentary research brief on the environmental considerations of pipeline construction cited blog posts. <laughs> this is not to say that research articles have no impact. This is not to say that the books we write are irrelevant. I don't think that's true. But there are new forms of publication that can mobilize our research in new ways to reach new audiences and to have an impact in a way that's more immediate than traditional forms of scholarly publishing. And we don't just have to write. Maybe there's other ways that we can mobilize our research using audio, <coughs> but not a mid 19th century phonograph. We could use podcasting. I've been podcasting since 2009 as well, an audio podcast published by the Network in Canadian History and Environment called Nature's Past, which highlights new scholarship in the field of Canadian environmental history and historical geography through interviews, roundtable discussions, and lectures. The podcast takes advantage of online communication to disseminate content widely. From December 2009 up to December 2014, the podcast has been downloaded 45,167 times, reaching a large Canadian audience, but as well as a large audience of listeners in the United States and other parts of the world. It's been integrated into teaching in numerous institutions at both the secondary and post-secondary levels. For many years, historians have complained that they've had limited access to the media to disseminate their research, to get those important research findings out there. But today we have tools that allow us to go directly to those audiences without having to have the intermediary of a newspaper or a radio station or a television station. 
And this is one example. Other question? Oh, no, okay. I'm really good at finding hands in classes. <laughs> Yeah, you saw that slide back uh, on my website. Okay, you'll have, to, you'll have to read this article that I wrote on the 1970s oil spills in Burrard Inlet. You were, you were there? Oh, okay, I've got some photographs of it too. Maybe you're in one of them. <laughs> the internet has changed scholarly communication for historians. This process of change is still under negotiation as it disrupts traditional models of publishing and introduces new outlets and new possibilities. In all three of these main areas of historical practice then, the internet I think has changed historical scholarship, the work of historians, and the way we tell stories about the past. And there's three challenges I think that historians will need to address uh, as we continue to adjust the discipline in the context of new technologies. The first is a problem with the digitization of the archive. While some historical records have been digitized and posted online, the pace of digitization and the scale of digitization in Canada has been slow and piecemeal. In 2012, again, Professor Milligan published a post on activehistory.ca revealing the failure of the so-called modernization program at Library and Archives Canada, or National Archives. The federal government had justified cuts to the archives in 2012 on the grounds that we would no longer need it because the materials were being digitized. Milligan revealed that, in fact, the digitization staff was cut by 50% in that round of cuts in 2012. And in the meantime, LAC has only digitized a fraction of its holdings. By 2007, it had digitized only three terabytes of data from the archives. To put that into perspective, the full printed collection of the Library of Congress is 250 terabytes. 250 terabytes. And Milligan points out an even bigger problem. Most of the records we produce now aren't printed. They're born digital, and they're never printed. How does an archive collect those for future historians? How will we know about this time in the future if our archives aren't collecting the records from this time? Well, LAC has a born digital collection program, and by 2012, it had collected seven terabytes of data. Seven terabytes of data. To put that into contrast, the Library of Congress, by 2012, had collected 254 terabytes of data and was collecting seven a day. We're not collecting these records. They're evaporating. They're in private collections. They're on your phones. They're in your computers. And I've also written in the past about the piecemeal and often inaccessible digital archive of Canadian newspapers, which makes it difficult and in some cases impossible for genealogists, local historians, as well as academic historians to get a sense of our newspaper archive in any kind of consistent fashion. It's so inconsistent across the country that we found that dissertations in Canadian history published in the period between 1997 and 2012 have a selection bias for the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star because they're the only newspapers that are comprehensively digitized. So when you put the number of references to these two newspapers up, to, up against Montreal newspapers, Edmonton newspapers, Calgary newspapers, Vancouver newspapers, Winnipeg newspapers, it's minuscule because it's so much easier to get these ones. But it's creating a problem. We have a Toronto bias in Canadian newspaper history. <laughs> All right, a second challenge, grappling with machine-assisted analysis. Text mining, optical character recognition, historical geographic information systems, these are just a few examples of software that can assist historians with the analysis of these massive amounts of historical data that we now have access to. The use of the tools, however, requires historians to develop new skills but it also requires us to reach out to other experts within our own institutions, between institutions who have the skills to develop software to read our records, computer scientists, geographers, and others. Historians need to begin to work more collaboratively. The vast majority of the things we write, our books and our journal articles, are written by one author, right? are written by one author, which is unusual. A lot of other disciplines are multi-authored publications. Historians, as they begin 
to uh, start to use machine-assisted analysis, we'll have to think about collaborative research more seriously. And finally, we'll have to think about how we teach digital history. One of the greatest mistakes I think we've made in history education at the post-secondary level is failing to recognize that the ways that the internet uh, has changed historical practice has also led to implications for how we teach history. I think we've carried on with a false assumption that our students are digital natives. That because they were born after the advent of the internet, that they inherited, via genetics I assume, <laughs> a knowledge of how to use these incredibly complex tools. And that's in fact not true. These are tools just like the tools of the past that have to be learned. That have to be learned. And so we need to think about how we're going to teach these skills at both the undergraduate and graduate levels in the future.